Well, brethren and sisters and young people, it is indeed a pleasure to be here with so many friendly faces again to come to round Yahweh's word and to look at what we can see on the world scene. You know, since we were here one week ago, we've seen Mrs. Merkel and Mr. Holland, in other words, Magog and Goma, go off to see Mr. Putin, Rosh, Meshach and Chubal. And what they're doing is trying to placate the situation in Ukraine. That's the way they view it. And then Putin, then Obama became involved. He says, we will give destructive weapons to Ukraine. That's the only answer. They said, no, 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 and backed off. And so we can see the situation looming where all of Europe will come under ultimately the control of Russia. You can't deal with Russia in the weak way we're seeing they're dealing with at the moment. And so things are moving. But that's not our subject tonight. Our subject, of course, is the area of Israel. So here's the reading that we've just looked at, brethren and sisters. And what we're seeing, of course, is that Jerusalem will be like protected as it was of old. Remember Moses, when he went down to Egypt, there was Israel like a burning, fire, a burning bush, but it was not harmed. It came out of pressure for all those around it, but it was not destroyed. That's Israel today too. That's Israel to do today, because after all, they are the apple of Yahweh's eye. And remember what we just read here for a moment in Zechariah chapter 2. He says to us there that what he will do, verse 2, Then said I, Whither goest thou? And he said unto me, To measure Jerusalem, to see what is the breadth thereof and what is the length thereof. And he says, I'm measuring, really, the idea is the time until which judgment will come upon it, and finally, the establishment of the Lord Jesus Christ and his kingdom. And we're looking forward to that time, aren't we? But let's remember, here's the Spirit of God. Let's retain that in our heart. Here's God's attitude to the Jewish people. Beloved, loved, his holy people, his chosen people, his peculiar treasure, the apple of his eye. Yahweh loves that people. Just incidentally, there's a little family. We went to Israel this year or last year actually, and they followed us through Hezekiah's tunnel, came out the other side, and there they are, they took those children with them through there. And it was lovely to have a little chat with them afterwards. But let's remember the overriding principle. Let us love and respect the Jewish people, knowing that they are God's peculiar treasure. Our spirit should be God's spirit, the spirit God has toward them. Now, this year has been quite pivotal. It is 70 years from almost the close of the Second World War, 70 years since Auschwitz was liberated. Six million died, and now, in Israel, they're returning. And the return number of actual Jews is six million in the land. It's almost as if the days are balanced. 70 years, a generation's passed, and here we are. It's as if that Holocaust number is now in the land and they're growing. The numbers are accumulating. This last year was the biggest figures for 10 years of return. And where are they coming from? They're coming from Ukraine, from the north, from the north as we read in their readings. And they're coming from France, USA and the UK. And what's driving them? Anti-Semitism. So they're coming back joyously into the land of Israel. And so the biggest population in the world today of Jewish people is in the land. Here's the population that was, is now in USA, and here's the population now of Jews, not Arabs, Jews, in the land. So it's interesting. We're at a very, it seems, pivotal point. And how long have we got to wait? Well, we know, don't we, that the Jubilee seemed to have worked. Remember that quote in Leviticus chapter 25 where it speaks of 49 years, 7 months, 10 days as the period from one Jubilee to another. God promises, and if it was sold for some reason, it's returned to that family at the end of that Jubilee, isn't it? Now, that's a bit of an oversimplification, but we haven't time to look at it in detail. 
So it's basically a 49-year period, isn't it? If you use it quite exactly, from the time of Eureka through to November the 2nd, 1917, when the Jews were promised the land, as was taught by Brother Thomas, which came from the scriptures very clearly, we come to that date that we know so well. Add another 49 years and you come to the Sixth Day War, almost exactly, almost exactly to the day. So what's going to happen now, brethren and sisters, if we add another 49 to it? I don't know. But it looks very, very critical, doesn't it? How long have we got? Next year, or maybe the year after, it'll be the end of that jubilee, another jubilee. And we're right at the edge of it. And what will it bring? Well, we can't be sure. We hope it brings Christ's return. Brother Thomas had these comments to make. Now, this is not so easy to read. I'll read it through with you. The return of security and prosperity to the tenth of the land, so he says the Jews dwelling in peace, must either precede the development of the one Yahweh man, that's us, being developed at Sinai through judgment. It must, peace must come just before Christ's return, in other words, or be concurrent with the operations in the recesses of Timon, Sinai. Or, it may, be, or it, many be, it may be in progress both then and before. So, brethren and sisters, what is he saying? Peace in the land comes just prior to Christ's return. You remember it says that in Ezekiel 38, that they're dwelling confidently in peace. Well, let's have a look at what's going on in the land at the moment and see what we see. All right. So an overriding comment was made, and it's quite it's a year or so back, that the winners, the ones who are benefiting from the Arab, wind, Arab Spring, is Jews. The upheaval of the last three years, he says, have left the Jewish state historic enemies universally weakened, while Israel goes from strength to strength. And again, Israel may well emerge as the only real winner of the Arab Spring. So Libya, Ethiopia, all of these countries, e you know, Egypt, carving themselves up in chaos. Look at Syria now. But what about Israel? The only real winner, it seems, as the Arabs are ca carving each other up in the troubles that are going on. So let's have a look at, come back to the last, uh, last year, the Gaza War. During that Gaza War, Israel had allies in the Arab world. Who were they? Jordan, Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates has effectively lined up with Israel in opposition to Gaza. They could see what Israel was standing for and lined up with her and supported her. But they're not the only ones. The Christians are too. Christian Arabs. Here we are, a man from up in the area of Nazareth. And he's encouraging in his congregation, the Jews, uh, the, sorry, the Christian Arabs, to join the Jewish army, the young ones, you young teenagers, he's saying. You get in the army because if the Arabs take over, the Muslims Arabs take over Israel, they'll eliminate us. So the number of Jews, uh, Arabs, joining the Israeli army jumped by 300%. 300%. Not just Christian Arabs, but also the Druze, because they can see what's going on outside the borders of Israel. The only safe place is in Israel. Israel can't fall if they're going to survive. So they're joining up with Israel and supporting it. And Israel, of course, has got to dwell confidently. Think of the Gaza war. What did she do? She put these on the borders of the Gaza war and was able to bring down every missile. Incredible technology. But she's developed more than that since then and presented at the Singapore Air Show a laser device to bring out ding down missiles that come from outer space, intercontinental ballistic missiles coming in. They come in at boggling speeds, but a laser can hit it and burn it out before it comes in. So Israel is looking very, very confident in many of the ways in which it's going, but it's still worried about the Issus. They're fearfully worried that the Issus might come into the West Bank. If they control the West Bank, they wouldn't have enough missile defence systems 
to control the whole of the border of the West Bank. They could do Gaza, but not the West Bank. It's too big. So Netanyahu said, we've got to go into the West Bank and stay there for a very long time. We're not going to back out. We're going to stay there and maintain a long-term military presence in the West Bank, lest the ISIS get into there. And so they are moving. Israel appropriates West Bank land for possible settlement use. 400 homes here, 400 over here, taking up farming land. And they're trying to carve up the West Bank somewhat so they can get it into enclaves that are easier to protect and stop terrorists getting into there and taking control of that area. It's quite frightening to see what's going on there. And so, brethren and sisters, things are moving dramatically. See, 400 hectares taken over. And just only over the last few days, they've said that they're going to destroy a number of the homes in the West Bank that were illegally built, funded by the EU, came up only on the web over the last day or two. 400 homes illegally built in parts of the West Bank. They're going to destroy them to make sure Israel can maintain its control of that West Bank. What about terrorism? There is a bit in Israel, but it's being reduced dramatically at the moment. Dramatically. Netanyahu is coming out with very firm policies. And his policy is, if a young man, and it's usually the young people, teenager, 20-year-olds, enacts a terrorist act in Israel, they will go back into the West Bank and their home will be bulldozed. So the parents know they've got to keep their children under control and they can't go in to Israel and start blowing people up. You know, it's a real advantage to the Palestinians to have their child do that. If they die in it, they are funded by the terrorist groups like the Hamas, or well, they were, up to a million dollars each. Lose a kid? Well, you do well. So Israel is saying there's a consequence and it's beginning to work. Now let's go and look at some of the neighbours, and we'll come back to Israel in a minute. What about Egypt? Helping Israel. We said that before. And we would expect that, won't we? Because we remember when the king of the north comes in, he attacks Egypt. Egypt's not going to be with Russia in the end. And things have been changing in Israel, Egypt. Mubarak, he was eh, relatively helpful to Israel. He's gone. Another man, Morsi, took over. He ran a religious group that was affiliated with the Hamas, we know as terrorists. He's gone now, and now this man, an army man, is back in power. Mubarak was an army man, and so here we've got General Al Sisi, and he's back in power. And so, much the same as in Mubarak's day, but now much more pro Israel, the rulership has changed. So, what's happening? Cairo fights Islamic militants in Sinai. The Egyptians send many of their soldiers into the Gaza Strip, uh, into the Sinaitic Peninsula. And they're losing men. You'll hear of, they've been hit. A busload of soldiers went by and 30 were killed. Another group of 20 died only a few days ago. Huge numbers of Egyptian soldiers are losing their life in Sinai because it's full of terrorists. <coughs> Sometimes Bedouin groups, trained by the terrorists. Sometimes people from the Gaza Strip, trained by the terrorists. And lots of people have been killed, says this magazine. Or Reuters, sorry, says. And they're spreading across the north of Sinai. According to one militant, about a thousand have been killed. Egyptian soldiers. Egypt says, we can't keep this up. It's just going too far. And the major problem is they're getting, getting weaponry coming in from Gaza. That's the way it used to be. So there's Gaza. We remember here's Israel. There we are, better map there. There's the Gaza Strip. And here's the boundary cut off from Israel. Israel's maintaining its border well. But this is open in a sense. Along here, people have built a lot of homes. And under the homes are tunnels coming up. And terrorists are bringing equipment in from the Sinaitic, across Sinai, from ships. 
and taking them across the Naz tunnels into Gaza. Gaza is getting equipped. But now it's going the other way. The Egyptians have cut off access to Gaza, and now they're bringing the weapons out here and attacking Egypt. So Egypt's acted. Over 1,200 smuggling tunnels have been destroyed, they claim. Seems hard to believe, doesn't it? These are figures I've just read from the papers. Seems stunning. And so here it is. Most of the tunnels have been destroyed. Every now and again they find a few more. But up until now, through those tunnels have been moved equipment and stuff and food and all sorts for the Gaza Strip, and the Hamas taxed it. And we're making 230 million a month with equipment coming in. Not anymore. Not anymore. Israel, Egypt has had enough. They've lost too many men. They've gone along that Gaza Strip, and maybe we'll go back for a minute. They've gone along here. And they've gone to the homes in that area just only in the last couple of weeks. And they said, we've had enough. Up to a kilometre away from the, that wall, that boundary, leave your homes and we'll pay for your house. If you don't leave, you'll lose it. And in came the bulldozers. And they levered the whole area. And that's what we're seeing here. Here's 60 of the tunnels destroyed and some of the homes being bulldozed and destroyed. Okay, clearing more than 800 homes, destroyed, displacing more than 1,100, but they can't do anything else. They've got to get rid of them. It's gone crazy. And now Egypt's also had enough with the Hamas. They've gone on to the international people who've said the Hamas are good guys and said, no, they're not. They're a terrorist organisation. Look at the date. It's a terrorist organisation, says Egypt, and acknowledge it. And label them very clearly that they are a real problem. A real problem. And so we can see things are moving. What's it like in Gaza now? Well, you can't get anything in and out. Israel's controlling the waters and its borders, and Egypt controlling the southern border. So if you work for the Hamas, you've been paid three times for three weeks' work since the Gaza war, that's six months. Hamas have received only three partial salary payments in 18 months. They couldn't do anything. They're not getting the money that they get from taxing those goods coming in. And they're trying to persuade Egypt to open the border up. And Egypt did, a week or two ago, opened it up for a little while, and they lost more men. They said, that's it, finite. We'll keep it closed. See how you go. <laughs> Some of the kids in Egypt, in Gaza, just a little while ago, just before Christmas, said to their parents. Apparently, it was widely reported. Why don't we become Christians? If we go Christians, the Jews let us cross out of Gaza and go across to Bethlehem for Christmas. If we do that, at least we can get out and in for a little while. It's horrible here. In my word, it would be. It would be. But at least it's bringing peace for Israel somewhat. Now let's move on to Jordan. Of course, we've all heard about Jordan of recent time, but let's recap it. We remember, don't we, that Jordan will be pro-Western. When Russia enters into the glorious land, and many countries shall be overthrown, these escape out of his hand, because they're not supporting Russia. Edom, Moab, and the chief of Ammon, which is the territory today of Jordan. All right. Now Jordan has always been very pro-Western. The king, King Hussein, his mother was born in Britain. His grandmother was born in Britain. So he's three quarters British, isn't he? And they've been very pro-British, and the British and the Americans have helped. Go back quite a way. Look at the date there. Large amounts of American equipment were sent there when they pulled out of Iraq, brought it into Kuwait. They took it into Jordan rather than take it back to America. It was oldish stuff, but now it's in there. And large quantities of American equipment is found in Jordan. Hard to see on that map, but there we are, little, little area of Jordan. So it's pro-Western and pro-Israel now. They were trying to get gas. They used to get gas 
a year or two ago from pipelines coming across the Sinai Desert from Egypt. No, not anymore. The terrorists down there, like they've been blowing up Egyptian soldiers, have been blowing up the tunnel or the pipeline. So where can you go to get gas for your power station? And you can rely on it? Well, of course. Israel. So they signed a $500 million gas deal to bring it into the Hashemite Jordanian Kingdom. And it's going to come from their first find, and it'll start this year, next year. So they're bringing gas into there. So aligned exactly as we would expect with the Western powers and with Israel. Fits exactly as we would understand. And we would have understood from Brother Thomas many years ago. Now, well, just to remind ourselves that horrible event, a man, poor man, who was killed, who was a pilot, a Jordanian pilot who flew into that area there, and he was destroyed. And immediately that, that happened, America said, we can see how you feel. We will give you equipment. We will support you. We'll help you. And the people were alarmed at what took place. Now, I don't say all of them, but most of them pulled, called on the government to eradicate the Islamic State. And my goodness, they have moved. More than America, up until this point, Jordan has gone. And there's their most famous pilot. King Hussein himself apparently boarded a plane and flew in and attacked these areas up here. Over 50 attacks have been launched into that area since that happened, and it was only a little while ago. Jordan is making a, a major effort to be involved in the battle against the ISIS. And as well as that, you would expect it, wouldn't you? The ambassador returned to Israel. Jordan envoy to go back to Israel after recall. There were some problems on the West Bank uh, in Israel over the Temple Mount, and the ambassador was called home. But not anymore. He's sent back to, his, back to Israel, and he's down there in Tel Aviv, where the embassy is held. So we can see Israel is fit, uh, Jordan is fitting exactly where we would expect scripturally, isn't it? Precisely. What about Arabia, referred to in the scriptures? Well, it should be a pro tarsian ally, isn't it? A little difficult for us yet to fully know where things are moving because the previous leader only died a few weeks ago and this man has taken over. He was the Minister of Defence for a while, so he switched on as far as weaponry and fighting is concerned. But let's remind ourselves of the stance they took of old. So I haven't changed the picture. There's the previous leader who's just died. And they were pointing out how worried they were over the weaponry building just across the coast from them. Nuclear. Iran's trying to build nuclear weapons. So Saudi Arabia said, we can't do it, but we got the money. So they went to Pakistan and asked Pakistan for their long-range missiles, bought them, and some caps to go on the top. And it's believed they've got some nuclear weapons there too, ready for Iran if Iran gets silly. And so. Here's how the papers once considered. I think it's quite true today. There was the leader of Iran a little while ago. We remember him. What nukes? We don't have them. That's what they're saying now. Not true. See? Sitting down with these guys works, said Obama, and he seems highly deceived, and we're seeing the same right now. We'll talk more on that in a minute. So how are they going to defend themselves? Well, this is what they're talking about. Israel said to be working with Saudi Arabia on an Iran strike plan. Come through us and hit Iran, we will be happy because it gets those weapons destroyed. And we know you're pretty good at it, Israel. And so it seems they've been talking behind the scenes on it. And of course, they have also been talking with this man, Cameron, the leader of Britain. Again, exactly the way we think. Now, that's not the new leader, that's the old one, but he's only been the new one, only been there a few weeks. So it's hard for us to get enough information about him at this stage. But he is working on this area. He's working on the area of Yemen. Now, where's Yemen? Well, there's the Gulf of Aden. Here's the uh, Indian Ocean. Okay, Saudi Arabia is in this area. Here's the Red Sea. Right at the bottom of there, isn't it? 
And we know that he is Aden of old, where Britain was. Brother Thomas obvious, often speaks about Britain controlling that area there again in the end to control the Red Sea. But at the moment, it's been taken over by the extremists. It's been taken over by these Al Quds who are linked with Iran and the Houthis, another group. Don't worry about the names. Uh, they're taking over this area here and they've kicked out the prime minister or president and he's had to flee the country. And so America's influence there is gone for the moment. Deferred, the previous leader deferred to America. Not anymore. And so things have changed. Now these terrorist groups or these tribes are linked to Iran. It's worrying the world terribly because still about a third of the world's, quarter of the world's oil passes through that Red Sea. They're very worried over it. And Saudi Arabia is moving on it straight away with this man. He's trying to influence those that are in this area here, that they might take back control of, of that reed area of Yemen, what we call Sheba of old, where the Queen of Sheba came from long ago. Now, let's come to this country. There's not much we can say. That's the state of Syria. Utter chaos. Israel enemy destroying itself within. Indeed, it is in a very, very difficult plight. Up to the north, the Issus crowd are taking over. Down in the south, Damascus and Assad is desperately trying to hold on to his control of the country. The weather changed the other day. Apparently, he flew 200 attacks up into the Issus area to hammer them. Winter had passed and it was a few clear days and he moved again. But he's not getting control totally of that country. It's chaotic. But what about Israel? Well, Israel has already said many times, it's one of the leaders over there, the Zion Defence Minister, warned several times that we have a red line. Don't cross it. And Jordan appears, uh, and Syria appears to be relatively speaking, honouring that, keeping away from that. Oh yes, terrorists come in which aren't under the control of Syria. The Hezbollah people come down only a few days ago, along with the uh, uh, Iranian chap, and Israel attacked them. But largely speaking, they've been staying away from attacking Syria. Some years ago, Syria, here's Assad, the leader of Syria, seeks Israel to, to continue to allow him at least to control his homeland territory. The Alawi group up there said, just keep on our side for the moment, because the place is out of control, utterly out of control. But let's move on, Iraq. There's Iraq and it's got ethnic groups in there or religious groups in there. The Kurds, which are one group, and then these Sunni and Shiites are two religious departments of the Arab area. Usually these are more radical than these, but these are the ones backing the ISIS at the moment, and they are much more radical. So what do we expect? We expect Persia to be associated with Russia. Persia includes the area that was occupied by Persia of old, from Iran to the Indus, Pakistan. So uh, uh, Iraq to Pakistan. So let's look at Iraq for a moment. What's going on there? The Shiites and the Sunni are taking over. So what do we know about that area? Well, let's go back to Brother Thomas. It's always a good fallback position. What does Brother Thomas say? Back in 1856, on the basis of the scriptures, he said the Shiites of Persia and the Sunnis hate each other with a hatred not exceeded by the Protestant, Orangemen, and the Catholics of Ireland. Terrorists really began there, didn't they? Murdered each other and blew each other up, you know, maybe 30 years ago. He said, that'll be the same. And she, she, that area, will be led to indulge in dreams of extending her frontier in the direction of Baghdad by the age of Russia. Goodness me. Are the Shiites and Sunnis blowing each other? Of course they are. And are they threatening Baghdad? Yes, they are. And who's coming to their help? Well, let's have a look. There's the area of Issus controlled now. And there they are moving down there, and they're not far from Baghdad. 
Oh, they're delightful people. When they take over, they're terrifying, to say the least. Here's a few people who were soldiers, threw the garments away so they couldn't be seen to be soldiers. When the Issus captured them, well, we won't leave that up there. And it's horrible to think about. That's the nature of them. And so they've expanded through this area here. They've threatened Saudi. They've threatened Jordan. When they threatened uh, Saudi mm, a few months ago, Saudi brought up 30,000 troops to the borders of there, and they backed down. They threatened Jordan here, and Jordan brought forward proof that the Western forces would help them and Israel, and they backed down. And they are continuing to move in this area, trying to take control of it. But they've got a problem. Saudi has a weapon, oil price. If we can plunge the oil price, we can bankrupt Iran and we can bankrupt Isi and, I guess, Russia as well as that. But the main area I'm sure they're thinking about was Iran and the Isi crowd. So Iran, they brought the price of oil down. They've hammered the pipelines up here, bombed them from the air. Fuel is not getting out from there easily into the Western world. They're not getting their money. So where's the ISIS going to get funded? They've got an action. This is what they did. Look at the date. ISIS forces capture Libya oil fields. So they got a terrorist group to go across near to Libya and attack an area and took control of the huge oil refineries and oil pipelines and things like that so they can export oil again. Might not be getting as much as they used to, but are still getting money to fund their weaponry. Incredible. But now, come back. They're threatening Baghdad, weren't they? They're just outside Baghdad. So where does Baghdad go for help? They ask the Americans to come to help. Mm. We'll send some planes over and bomb a few for you, but we won't give you weapons. They ask Iran, and Iran says, we don't trust the people in Baghdad. We won't do it. Initially, that's what they did. So then they asked Russia. Guess what? Reportedly delivering weapons to Iraq immediately. That's quite a bit back when Baghdad was first threatened. Now, I don't know of any more, but they were flying stuff in straight away for the troops of Iraq. Now, let's move on to Iran. Russian ally, a dangerous threat to the free world. That's what we would expect, isn't it? Going to be with Russia, isn't it? And here are, ah, there we are, the key part of Persia is Iran. And what have they been concentrating on to? Developing weapons. Look at their missiles that changed as the years gone by. Iran could destroy Israel in less than nine minutes, they boasted, when we've got our missiles ready and now they've got ICBMs that go into orbit and can come out in, over America or Australia without any more fuel, just goes into orbit and when you fire your re-entry rockets, you drop into that particular country. At that point, they could travel 3,400 kilometres and enter at 4,000 metres a second. You would never hit them on a normal gun. Lasers can hit them. And so they are developing weapons. Putin came across to the G8 meeting in, Camp in uh, Brisbane. When he came back, his first contact was Iran. And they were ready to talk to, the Americans were ready to talk to Iran about them stopping building nuclear weapons. And they were going to meet on November the 25th. Just before they got there, Russia did something. This is what Russia did deal calls for Russia to build eight nuclear re reactors in Iran. Pulled the plug on the meeting straight away. We'll start building two nuclear reactors straight away and we'll bump it up to eight, said Mr Putin. What could the Western world do? The talks collapsed. Absolutely collapsed. It was useless. Chaotic events were going on. And so things are moving very dramatically as things go on. Now, the price of oil has dropped. It's hurting Iran. What was the first action that was taken? Well, here's one of them. 
They moved into Libya. They bombed in Libya. This is before the ISIS took control of quite a significant area. They went in and bombed some of the oil tanks on the coast and pushed the oil price up a little. They didn't stop there. On November the 25th, I don't, uh, 26th, I don't know if they were choosing a special day, but you know, they closed the Persian Gulf. They had for a week the largest Iranian manoeuvres ever seen at the headwaters of the Persian Gulf. Message, America, Britain, the rest of the world, if we want, we can close this Gulf. You be careful what you do with us. We can close it. So out came their aircraft, out came their ships, and for a whole week they manoeuvred in that to prove they are in control. Brother Thomas had a comment on that. The lion power of Britain will have to, I believe, seize from Dedan, and she may command the entrances to the Persian Gulf. It's the only way. The economies of the world would cripple. And Britain acted straight away after that. Well, in fact, the dates before that, but they knew about it earlier than that. And Britain, not America, Britain, says we're going to build a base, control a base here in Bayran. The first British overseas military east, uh, Middle East military base since 1971. Why there? Well, it's obvious. They're going to have to control that. Or for a moment, if Iran wishes to, it can cripple the world. And things are moving desperately. Look at the date, January the 22nd. Look at what they've photographed. That's what they've photographed. It's a missile base, and it's one that can go into orbit. It's an I-intercontinental ballistic missile. You fire it up and it goes into orbit. It stays in orbit till you want it to re-enter. A direct threat to the United States as well as Israel. Come out of orbit anywhere. And where's, what's Israel thinking about that? The role of Israel leader is to adopt the policies that protect Israel, says he. We are bothered by this. We are so sincerely bothered by this. We don't want it to happen. But now, Obama is to go over there only in a few weeks and talk to them. Talk to them again. And what's the plan? We'll look at that in a second. But they are in Iran laying the framework to get exactly what they want. So, Iran's Ayatollah flags push for a nuclear agreement. A deal with the West on limiting their country's nuclear capacity. Yeah, we'll sign that so far. But somebody's upset about it. Prime Minister of Israel. We will allow Iran to arm itself with nuclear weapons, something which will endanger the existence of Israel. He says, I'm going to act against that. They're galloping towards that. It's only a little way away. It's very desperate, he says. I'll come back to that in a minute. So, what's USA going to do? USA, it looks like, according to Reuters, a very, very you know, consequential reporter, not a crazy reporter, says USA has got a cunning trick up its mind. It's going to ask Iran to take on the ISIS. So if they're fighting each other, they'll just carve each other up. That's what they're hoping. Nobody can control either of them. So that's what they're aiming to do. They're saying we'll form a military alliance between USA and Iran in the area of Iraq, where the ISIS are. A stark lack of options has forced the USA to side with someone who they never would before, Iran. And here's what they're suggesting, according to Debka, one of the Israeli commentaries. They're saying to Iran, why don't you expand through here, eh? Take control of all that way, and you get control of the ISIS. And you get control of northern Lebanon and such like. Sounds a good idea. But Persia or Iran's got further thoughts. It would like that. To the borders of Israel. And Israel's not terribly happy about it. Here's a little picture meant to be Mr. Net uh, Mr. Netanyahu. His response. Does it fit? I think it does. I think it does. 
I'd be feeling that same way too if I was the Prime Minister of Israel. They're very worried about him at the moment. Within a month he's going over and he's going to talk to the Congress. And they know it will be anti-Obama and pro more the right wing. America's really bothered by it, or Obama is, as to what he's going to say, but we'll see. I think it's about a month and a day before he goes over there to talk. So it'll be very, very interesting to hear what he says when he does. It'll be one of the most consequential speeches out, I should imagine. All right. Well, time's running away. Let's come closer to home, to Israel. Lebanon, a home for, the chaotic for all the chaotic groups. There it is, bordering with Israel. Down here is the Hezbollah terrorist group, funded again by Iran, threatening Israel. And so what's Israel doing? Well, Hezbollah is spent to have at least 170,000 rockets capable of hitting Israel. But of course Israel has got the Iron Dome and now their new laser devices. How well it works, we don't know, but they seem amazingly backing off with the Hezbollah. They had an opportunity to really hammer them the other day. Two of their soldiers got shot by the Hezbollah on the northern border of Israel. Israel flew their bombers in intact and then backed off and a message came to them through USA. The Hezbollah said, look, we don't want the war to go any further. And Israel said, all right. And yet they had an opportunity to go further if they were very bothered by it. What's worrying the Hezbollah? And why is Israel quite happy about things at the moment? Well, this see, appears to be it. The Islamic State fighters mass on Lebanon's border and threaten to launch attacks across it. Where? To the north of Lebanon. So up in the north part of Lebanon, in are coming the Isis, and down the south the Hezbollah are threatening Israel. Jordan said, uh, Lebanon said, Get your soldiers out of here and head up north and protect us. And that's what they're doing. Just mayhem, isn't it? That's a chaos. But again, the trouble in the Arab world, his hand shall be against every man's hand, Genesis 16, is certainly happening. And keeping the Arabs off the back of Israel. And you know, Lebanon really is crazy because... It's got a huge potential if it only it wants to. Look at this. Cyrus, Cyprus and Israel's oil and gas reserves have been exploited somewhat. They've been finding oil. But the area they are expecting to find huge amounts further is not being tested. Up at here. It's now Lebanon's turn, they say. And applications to exploit that oil have come from a few companies. Exxon, Chevron, Rosneft, uh, Total, Stat Oil, Ro uh, Dutch Royal Shell, and so on. 52 companies have applied for licenses there. Those huge fines in Israel, they reckon, go right up along the coast. And Lebanon could be well off. So, on two sides Laos attack Israel, poverty stricken, war death, destruction. And we could leave ourselves vulnerable from the north, from the Isis. On the other hand, if we've got a brain in our head, and I don't know if that's quite true at times, we could be well off. And so when we look at the Arab world around Israel, what are we seeing? Well, brethren and sisters, all Israel's Arab neighbours are preoccupied in civil war. Nearly all of them. One way or another. Or they're like Egypt and Jordan, re-looking at their relationship with Israel. So things are moving nicely for Israel, relatively speaking, isn't it? Well, now let's look, come back to Israel for a moment. Let's look at Israel's economy. Remember, we're looking at a particular quote. Uh, Ezekiel chapter 38, verse 13 says, She'll be rich in silver and gold and cattle and goods, economically strong, a good producer of food. Temptation to Russia to invade, ultimately. book came out a few years ago. Got a copy at home. There it is. The Startup Nation. The story of Israel's economic miracle. Amazing stuff in it. Now you take the Jews. 
extremely bright. We, I've got a list of various different Nobel Prize winners, but let's just have a look at it. 2013, when I had last figures on it, there were 193 Jews who had won Nobel Prizes. Now, if you strap, extrapolate that out, the number of Nobel Prizes won by the Arabs at the same time and increase the population of Israel from what it is, or the Jews, from what it is today to what the Arabs are, they would have won 4,135 to four Nobel Prizes won by the Arabs. Is that a measure of brain capacity? I don't know. But look at it, staggering. The Jews have won 22% of the world's Nobel Prizes. Their population is 0.2% of the world. Just think of it. It's just stunning. They are the startup nation, they say. The story of Israel's miracle. Israel produces more startup companies that are large, peaceful, and stable nations uh, than stable nations like Japan, China, and so on. They beat everybody, hands down. Israel's got the highest density of tech startups, two and a half times USA. Look at the size of USA, 30 times Europe, 80 times India, and so on. Staggering. Now, young people, here's a little cube. Don't worry about that chap there. He's their um, tr minister of trade. But a company called Viber. Uh, you see, in, in Israel, you go in the army when you come out of, out of high school, you go in for four years. And what do they do? They teach you to fight, teach you to fight, but they also teach you to think fast. Because they have found that fast thinkers on the battlefield do well. And they're training them. Don't know how. But when they come out, my goodness, what they are achieving is staggering. Four young people got together and they began to work on this company called Viber. So you can go on your web, on your handheld, and you can send a picture of yourself anywhere in the world to your friend and be on the phone to them. They sold it just a, few, a little while ago, look at the date, uh, this time last year, for 900 million. Not a bad startup job. So there you are. I think there are only about two or three years working on it. Feet up in front of a computer, having a good time, chatting away, then sell it for 900 million. And it hasn't stopped there. Now, I could multiply this many times, but let's look at what's coming up soon. This one. You got a cell phone? OK. Do you ever get anything go wrong with you? Well, in future, you won't have to worry very much about it. Your cell phone will be a sniff phone. Israel's developed it already. And you sniff into it, and it will analyse it, send the information to a computer somewhere, probably in Israel, pay a little bit for it, and tell you to come back and say, you're going really healthy. You might have to do a few more runs or something like that. But you know what I mean? It will apparently be able to analyse early quite a lot of illnesses. Early interception often means the illness doesn't go anywhere and you get it's defeated or it's overcome by medicine. So there's the new one. The phones will come out with it probably automatically in it in future. And so, you know, you phone it up and say, you're going well today. <laughs> well, hopefully it doesn't tell us we're not going too good. But there are other things are coming up. They have just um, launched one of the biggest floats on the world scene ever. The biggest Israeli IPO, that's a float for a company, just been launched in America. Look at the date. Okay? But when did it end? Its, its value was several billion dollars floated. And it's a company that's going to, it's linked to Tesla, who produces this car here. And they are producing in it driverless cars. That would be great, wouldn't it? I don't know if my grandson's terribly happy. He's looking forward to becoming a driver. He'd love to be out there driving a car, but now he'd be able to hop in the car and Dad say, fine, I take the keys, I'll turn it on for you, and it'll drive you where you want to go safely. They reckon 40,000 people will save their lives every year because of it. It will work out distances, it'll break, it'll do everything for you so you don't get hurt. Two years, they reckon, it's away. And, of course, it's a huge float. The valuation of the float was 7.5 billion. Everybody wanted to get into it, and they knew Israel would be right on top of it. So here's a company floated in America, backed by an Israeli sources. It's obvious, isn't it? And of course, Israel hasn't stopped in hunting for oil. 
Look at the date. Just like last year, found a new field. There it is. There's the Leviathan, there's the Tamar, and now they've got this new one. And this one is pretty well 100 per cent owned by the Jews. So it's expanding dramatically. Not only are they doing that, they're selling arms all over the place. Uh, they've been over talking to the Indians, selling equipment to them. Israel defence equipment exports have reached seven billion US dollars in 2012, and it continues to expand. Continues to expand. So it's booming with brilliant technology, natural resources, huge exports, and also in food. They leave us for dead. We are 280 times bigger than they are, and we've got deserts like they've got deserts, but yet they're about 20 or 30 times more productive per acre than we are. Incredible. Staggering. They are very good at it. So Israel's agriculture exports are booming. Well, brethren and sisters, as you look at Israel today, around her, a lake of fire, fighting each other, chaotic. They threaten Israel, it seems, at the moment, and then all of a sudden somebody coming in the back door, attacking another Arab country or another Arab force. And Israel seemed to be living blithely on a burning bush that's not consumed. We did that in our readings only a little while ago, didn't we, back in Exodus chapter 3. It's now true again in some regards. The great mercy of our God is extended to that people who he loves. How long will it last? Is this the peace that Brother Thomas expects before Christ comes? Is next year something consequential, a jubilee from the state of Israel? We don't know, brethren and sisters. But let's not go to sleep spiritually. Now let's conclude with this, just a little quirky thing. The debt in USA. I went on the web only a few days ago, there's a clock going up, it's ticking away all the time, and we've, the USA's reached 18 trillion debt. Now how big's a trillion? Well, one trillion seconds equals 31,688 years. That's a bit of a feel how much a trillion is. So that's over five times as long as we've been on this earth. Man's been here since creation. Huge time. That's counting every second. Every second. So if America paid it off at $18 a second, it would take 31,688 years to pay it off. They're in a mess. If the world economy begins to break up, and they've got the international currency, so it's guaranteed not only by them but by the world, if that begins to break up, and Mr Putin's working to do just that right now, we can see we are living on borrowed time. On borrowed time. And we're not much different here in Australia, are we? But we're dependent on the international currency as well as every other country. So, brethren and sisters, what about it? Let us not sleep as do others. Let us watch and be sober. Who do you watch first? Where do you watch first? Yes, the sign's important, but watch ourselves. How are we going with prayer, our daily readings, and our Bible classes? How are we walking in the truth? Are we sober in that which we do or going worldly ways? Best thing, put on the breastplate of faith and love for a helmet and the hope of salvation. Time is short, brethren and sisters. I don't know how long it's going to be. We, you don't. But it sure looks like it could be any time. And so let us be very serious about the things that really do count. Our God, his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and his return from heaven. Thank you.